ever had an idea for how your area, your community, could be better? Would you start a gardening project with your neighbours? Would you create a community kitchen where everyone's kids could learn to cook? Have you ever thought to yourself, you know what, I'm just going to make this happen? Last summer, two friends and I had exactly that feeling. We were busy with full-time work and studies when I came across this article about a borrowing shop in Berlin. This borrowing shop was a community space where people could come to borrow useful items whenever they needed them. Items like power tools, lawn mowers, sewing machines, tents, gazebos. The idea just felt right to me. I'd always loved bringing people together around a cause. And could I find a way to do this so I might be paid to work for it one day? I sent the article to my two friends, Emma and James. James, who's quite impulsive, simply sent back a Twitter handle, at Library of Things. I clicked on the link and saw one tweet. Library of Things has launched. Following James's lead, we decided the best way to make Library of Things a reality was to create a tiny version of it in our spare evenings and weekends beside our day jobs. We found some free temporary space for three months in a public library in West Norwood, not far from Brixton. To make furniture for the space, we went out on London's pavements, scavenging old chests and shelves and dragging wooden pallets from industrial sites. We put out a call to creative people living locally to come and help us make the space. And we waited to see who would come. For nothing more than the promise of a bit of cake and a challenge, 12 energetic, practical people came along and rolled up their sleeves. And after one day of planning and designing and sanding and painting, we revived a fairly lifeless room in a library and made a strong group of friends who are still our strongest advocates today. The following week, we were open for borrowing. And how it worked in those first few weeks was that people donated an item or volunteered their time, and in exchange, they could borrow whatever was on our shelves. Admittedly, in week one, those shelves were fairly barren, save for an old toolbox and some sleeping bags. But by weeks four and five, they were starting to groan under the weight of strimmers and sewing machines and surfboards and a full Nintendo set. Some of the donations were less expected than others. One person came in brandishing a green velvet lampshade, for example. But other people came in with wheelbarrows full of incredibly valuable stuff. One woman, a local newspaper editor, her name was Hilary, she came in with armfuls of circular saws and electric sanders and power drills. And she said to us, you know what? These things have been sitting in my shed for the last four years. I don't think my husband has ever touched them. I still don't know whether Hilary's husband knows where they've gone. We came back to tidy up at the end of the three month test phase and were astonished to find this whole queue of people asking where we'd gone. Have you guys got a, a marquee I can borrow? Have you got a sat nav? I need your sewing machines. Our inbox was flooded with requests from further afield too. People wanting to start a library of things in Birmingham, Cardiff, Leeds, Bolivia, Australia, the Philippines. It was at this point, I think, that the potential of the project started to dawn on us. I've made it all sound quite easy so far, and I have to admit that it hasn't been. Sometimes the setbacks have been to do with the project itself. Getting up at six in the morning to complete legal documents before work. Or being rejected time after time by grant givers because we were too small or too big 
and spending eight months on a seemingly impossible search for affordable space in South London. And then sometimes the setbacks have been more human. I remember around Christmas time last year, sending through this stream of consciousness style email to Emma and James, outlining why the project could and should be bigger and better. I poured my heart and soul into it in its four month existence and was scared it might just be one of those good ideas that is born and then dies a few months down the line. I mentioned how we might design the project so it would pay us to work on it properly one day. I mentioned that it might be a UK-wide phenomenon. I said, this might even have potential to change the way we consume as a society in the West. There was the equivalent of an awkward silence via email whilst Emma and James digested this particular bombshell. Two days later, I got a reply. Emma said she was tempted to quit the project because of the weight of ambition and pressure she felt on her shoulders alongside an intense job. I think I learned from the experience that regardless of what happens with the project, the well-being and energy of the team always has to take priority. I learned that if you're going to dream big, you also need to plan big to grow the team to get you there. What kept me going though, through moments of self-doubt and frustration, was feeling the sheer rush of people get behind us and the idea. We ran a Kickstarter campaign earlier this year to get funds for our new home. And people I hadn't met since primary school crawled out of the woodwork to say, I love the project, how can I be involved? Our old members in West Norwood were out in the cafes and bakeries there, telling their friends about it. Such was the support, in fact, that we reached our £12,000 target within seven days. I was back in West Norwood recently at a community dinner with people who had set up similar projects in the area. Chatting to Wayne, who'd set up a bee-friendly garden near the bus garage, and Tara, who'd set up a sewing initiative for people living locally, made me feel more connected to and proud of West Norwood than I've ever felt about any other place in the UK. The dream now, and it is a dream shared by all three of us, is to enable communities around the UK to create a library of things for, of their own. With that, I want to leave you with some questions. What would your dream project be? What's stopping you from starting it? And if you already have one, how do you go about slowly turning that into your day job? Because at that point, I reckon, it feels like you aren't even working anymore.